History stretches back 5,000 years. 5,000 years ago, there were already great cities in existence. What is good about cities is the same now as it was then. As Sophocles put it, the city is people. I beseech you to join with us in our merry celebration. All hail! All hail! All hail! All hail. All hail. Sometimes in the city, uh, people who just go by, they won't notice anything at all. Like coming up on the L today, nobody really noticed, which I thought was fabulous, because I was wearing this whole thing, as you see it now. I prefer the country to the city, but, you know, you have to make a living. The city, there's a lot going on, but the farm just, uh, I don't know, there wouldn't be enough action. I guess it's people. And that's the reason I like Lincoln Park, too, because there are a lot of things happening. A wonderful sense of community. What's important about a sense of community? Why should that exist? Because it doesn't exist many places in Chicago, I don't think. And this is one of the places that it does exist. It's good. Barbara? Lincoln Park is a lively community in Chicago. More than many other parts of the city, there is still a lingering sense of the village something that is hard to find these days in American cities. And that, many experts believe, is exactly what is wrong with them. The basic building block of the city is the neighborhood, the village within the city. Without viable neighborhoods, the city becomes a collection of strangers, an anonymous and faceless place. From about uh, 12,000 years ago, the vast majority of people all through the planet have lived in small villages and neighborhoods. Up to within the, uh, the last 50 years, four-fifths of the population on this planet lived in villages. This is an environment which has a long tradition. Take Greenwich Village. Uh, Greenwich Village was, or wasn't a village even 100 years ago in the old sense, and yet there was a kind of neighborliness and friendliness, recognition that they were part of the same unit, People used to be proud of being members of the old Ninth Ward, much more than they were proud of being uh, New Yorkers. Uh, these qualities are the things that uh, kept the, uh, these are the human qualities, the underlying face-to-face uh, -face realities, which uh, our impersonal, abstract culture has almost wiped out. A city is not bricks and mortar. 
glass and steel. It is the life, the human life, the web of interrelationships that is important. City life is the life of many people living close together. The social structure of the city is far more important than the buildings themselves. High-rise buildings have given us the ability to concentrate fantastic numbers of people in small areas. What we have failed to consider is the effect this environment will have on the social organization of the city. The way people have lived for 12,000 years isn't to be dismissed and written off just because somebody is going to make a profit out of uh, providing a different kind of city for them to live in. Well, I think New York is insane in building out to the bulkhead line with a brand new layer of city which will tower above everything we see there now when New York has a marvelous uh, chance to limit its growth and have the growth happen in the boroughs and in other places. Uh, there's some kind of insane uh, process which says that uh, we must realize all potential real estate values. Growth itself and bigness and power alone don't make a great city. People talk, as Jane Jacobs does, about the great city. At the moment when it's in the state of complete deterioration, when uh, life is scarcely possible anymore in our biggest city. have been built for profit instead of people, or to minimize costs at the expense of people. The most extreme example is public housing. One of the worst of these is the pruitt Igo project in St. Louis. This now defunct prison for the poor consisted of 36 buildings. Although it was anticipated that large numbers of children would live there, the project was originally built without a single playground. Over the years, pruitt Igo bred violence and misery. There was an interaction between the design and the problems that the community had, particularly the heavy concentration of children and uh, early teenagers and the lack of an ability to control those kids and their behavior so that in many ways the people in pruitt Igo felt tyrannized by children, whether it was children dropping rocks or bottles out of high windows as you walked under the buildings or children breaking your windows, and then the management, uh, which was hardly very competent or understanding, making you pay for the windows which uh, your neighbor's children had broken. And people in Pruitt Igo often spoke of it as a jungle, and uh, they tended to hold rather dim views of their neighbors, and they saw the place as a, as a dangerous, difficult, morally threatening uh, environment that tended to make people feel over time that perhaps there was something wrong with them or otherwise they wouldn't be stuck in a place uh, like that. I think it had particularly that effect on uh, the children in the project. In our short-sighted drive to realize all potential real estate value or to cut costs at the expense of basic human needs, we have set in motion forces that will beset us for a long time. Crime in the urban environment is epidemic. And, short of a police state, there is no way law and order can be policed into being. Order must be organic. People must have a stake in the functioning of the city. Something to gain by that order. Something to lose if the order breaks down. A sense that it is responsive to their needs. The children of pruitt Igo, like the children of the streets in many parts of our cities, have experienced a hostile, bitter, and sometimes brutal world. Is it any wonder that they give as bad as they got? Oh, what a meal! Stuffed, huh? Amazing, really. really stuffed. What a meal. Listen now, slides of 
Afghanistan no, right now. You're ready to listen. What? I have to go home. Oh, no. Hey, no, honey, he said he, honey, come here. He said he had to go home. Oh, no. I got to go home. Look, no, when, it, uh, when it gets late, it's very dangerous outside, so I thought well, I'd get home no, before the trouble starts. No, you have a point. It is a jungle out it there. Is, I know. Oh, and not only there. Did you tell? No. I didn't tell him. Not only on the street here. Oh. What do you mean? In, the, in our high rise, the yeah. lady next door was stabbed. She was raped, repeatedly assaulted, and they ripped off her whole stereo system. Oh. <laughs> they ripped off. Really? How many speakers? She had four honey. speakers. Beautiful four. walnut, uh, oh, walnut, and uh, they had the A German headset, uh, turntable and quadraphonic oh, sound. Thing. Tragic. Beautiful okay. Okay. Everything went. Terrible. Listen, just terrible. terrible. What? Are you parked near here? A couple blocks. Run to your car. <laughs> Run to my car. Parked me down the middle of a street in a zigzag motion in and out of the light, see? No, I don't think so, honey. What do you mean? No, I really... Well, hey, if then. the police see him running in this neighborhood, they'll shoot him on sight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure? He's yeah. got I'll, to... I'll take a cab to my car. All right? Okay, okay that's your good. It's the only All right, I'll do One that. more thing. What? 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 If you get home... When I get home? Oh, when I get home? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When you get home, just give us a ring. Let us know you're safe. Okay, that's she a good idea. That is and listen, in addition to that, why don't you buzz up from the lobby? Yeah. Just to let us know you made it that far. <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right, if you think it's necessary. Oh, you can't be too safe. You want to let me out? You're yeah. precious. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. All right, you listen, you do me a favor. Lock your door as soon as I leave. Are you kidding me? I got a whole heart attack in here. All right. Best of luck. Take it easy. Bye-bye. So long, Harold. Love that guy. Great guy. Somebody else, honey. What do you mean there's somebody out there? Somebody out there. Who is it? Harold! Oh, no, it's not. No, that's a cat fight. Why do cats so knock on doors? Oh, but they think it's something. Maybe. They sound just like the other thing. Now, wait a minute. Hey, see, that's a human knock. I don't knock. You call the police. I don't know their number. Now, look, the lady next door. Probably with a piece of paper. He's you like him better than you I do. You went to college with him. I didn't go to college. You invited him. I here. lied about college. You invited him to college. But maybe he started something no, out there, honey. No, I don't know. All right, Harold, I'm coming. I'm coming, Harold. I'm coming. Oh, God, what happened? You caught my finger in the door. <laughs> <laughs> Harold, you got to get out of here. 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 One of the unique characteristics of our age is that we are all within reach. Nowhere is this more true than in a big city. Large numbers of people live in close proximity. No man is an island. Thus, it is difficult to escape your neighbor's problems. The urban poor are, for all practical purposes, trapped in the city. You know, we live in an economy that is more and more interdependent. In the old days, if you didn't make it in the city, you had an exit. And the exit was to go back to the farm. Uh, even in the Depression, the Great Depression, the very substantial number of city unemployed went back to the farms. Today, I think it's 4% of the workforce is in rural areas, and many of them are, are very poor, marginal farmers. Uh, who in the city slums has a relative back on the farms? Answer, damn few people. So that when the slums don't work, as indeed they don't, uh, there's no exit. You're, you really are stuck there. The old escape hatch was literally migration. I mean, you went from the city to the country. The new escape hatch has to be the ability to find a workable career in the city itself, a livable life in the city itself. You've got to find jobs for people. You've got to train people to make those jobs. Those jobs have to be better than dead-end jobs. The top priority has to be for families that are poor to have the kind of incomes that will allow them not to be poor anymore. We managed to think up almost every other possible intervention, but somehow we're not able to see to it that families just don't have to live with low incomes. The eradication of poverty would probably do more than any other single act to improve city life. But many things are necessary. We must tame the explosive growth of the city and tailor it to the needs of the people who must live in it. How is this to be done? The first step is by simply asking the people what they want. By coming in with a fresh idea, first of all, and then slowly approaching the people in the community and finding out what's in their minds and uh, what they think should be done. Often they have very good ideas which they haven't been able to, uh, to explain to anybody or get anybody to listen to when we get to replanning our communities, we can plan them so as to make cooperation much easier, make cooperation between parents looking after their uh, children, babysitting. Nobody can look after uh, their children successfully if they're 15 stories above the ground and the little child who is in need of a mother's help 
is 15 stories away from them. The urban environment is the most complex series of systems we've yet to devise. Technology has given us the tools to build enormous buildings in a matter of months. It may also help us to build them right. At MIT's School of Architecture, computer scientists are working out methods for predicting the effect of urban designs before they are actually constructed. The problems are too complicated for one man to solve now. That's uh, an accepted fact. That's why uh, the team concept, for instance, of, of in designing is, is uh, becoming very common these days. Uh, we're just proposing that, the, that a machine be one member of the team. Let's look at the situation as it now exists. It's largely done on the basis of intuitive decision making, um, on the basis of economic decisions, on the basis of people that have money, can make decisions in positions of power. Um, they aren't likely to change their mode of decision making unless they're shown something better. Charles Libby works with a computer language called Discourse, which he helped invent. The problem he's working with here is how to arrange the open space within a projected development so that it will be most accessible to the children who will live there. Stored in the computer's memory are various attributes of the proposed development. Information from maps and aerial photographs, population densities, and so on. Libby first asks the computer to display the kind of information it has on the subject. Then he asks how many kids will live there. Answer, 1,262. In this display, dots indicate low density. H indicates high density. O stands for open space or park. Using mathematical models that describe the way children use parks, the computer determines the number of kids who will use the park on an average nice day. Answer, 412. Libby and the computer then participate in a dialogue that generates alternatives to the original plan. Finally, they arrive at an arrangement of open space better than the original plan. 473 kids would use the park instead of 412. A lot of what we're trying to do is to give people access to uh, computers in a much more human way, uh, humanize the computers, if you will. James Taggart works with a computer language called Hunch. Hunch allows people to communicate with a computer directly by means of sketching. Other computer languages being developed deal with the interrelationship of common space, such as an urban neighborhood, and with the flow of services in an urban environment, police services, sanitary services, and so forth. Thus, it may be that the computer will form the basis of a nervous system that will help us coordinate human needs in the built environment. The computer may help us, but it will not bail us out. Basically, our problems are not technological, but human. The city is people. Until, as a society, we come to terms with that fact. Until we understand that a healthy city must articulate the life and needs of its people, we have little hope of improving the situation. In our great cities, a large part of the population show no vestige of the human heritage. They are hostile to each other, and hostile to the rest of the community. We must, uh, the one great task of man from the very beginning was how to become human. We must learn this all over again. Yes, I, yeah, you ought to let Zeus into your life. I don't need it. Now he's bringing you peace. I 
don't need it. You don't want Pete? I want Pete. You don't want Pete? What are you, some kind of pig? You don't want oh, Pete? Some kind of pig or something? Oh, you don't want Pete? Oh, I give you peace. I'm not a pig. I'm not a pig. Pig? Who's a pig? Huh? No, no. Call me a pig? Oh, Come on, hot sauce. Spend the blame. Oh, Come on, guys like you make me sick. Oh, he's screaming about police brutality. I'll show you police brutality. <laughs> Where's your car parked? I'm going to give you a ticket. <laughs> The ugliness I find in cities today is the uh, ugliness of a deranged organism which is destroying itself. And uh, it's like a garden full of weeds or it's like anything that isn't working. functional um, distress of, of great cities that require people who live in them to suffer incredible amounts of inconvenience and hazard and delay and so on and long drives to work. Uh, they're becoming less and less habitable. People were too tired at the end of the day to deal seriously with political uh, problems. They left it to the boss. Originally, they left it to the king, some kind of centralized authority. Now they have enough leisure uh, to spend on politics. And there's nothing more fascinating. Dealing with other men, dealing with manipulating, controlling, cooperating with other men. And as soon as people learn that uh, this, is, this is the real, one of the real games of life, uh, they'll begin, they know uh, politics uh, can be used for many purposes. It can be used uh, for corrupt purposes too, but it can also be used for enlightened ones. And when a sufficient number of intelligent, animated, and uh, emotionally undisturbed citizens are interested in politics, the city's uh, uh, new kind of city will grow around us faster than ever before. I believe direct citizens' action is necessary in Chicago simply because our elected officials are responsible to the democratic machine, they're responsive to big business, and they're all responsive to money. But they are not responsible to the average citizen, you and me. We have perfect example today, a hundred senior citizens taxpayers and residents of Chicago, some of them for 50 years. They were down at the county board with a simple plea, help us save our homes. In Chicago, a group called the Citizens Action Program is composed of intelligent, animated, and emotionally undisturbed citizens interested in politics. CAP participates in the political life of the city, and not just in an election year. Dennis Sweeney, who's worked with CAP for more than a year now, is an ex-Chicago policeman who learned a lot about how the city operates while he was on the force. As a patrolman on the street, generally you only see the small things, but you learn right off that money means power. I'm talking about things as small as fixing a parking ticket, the things as large as getting a permit to build Lake Point Towers on the lakefront. It all comes down to the same thing. At camp, we feel there's only one answer. That's what Len Doobie calls people power. Lots of people with big mouths, and they use them. And that's all we've got, besides our research and occasional technical expertise, to fight the men who want to destroy our lake in the name of urban progress. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Paul Booth. I'm representing the Citizens Action Program, or CAP. The Citizens Action Program is an eco ecology organization. It is also a taxpayer's organization. It is not true that this is a tax boon to the city of Chicago, these high-rise plans. In fact, it is a tax drain. There is another city in the world. It was said that uh, there are none with lakefronts as uh, beautiful as ours. There's at least one. Uh, Geneva, Switzerland, where some of our local politicians bank. <laughs> you can be sure that they don't build high-rises on that lakefront. As a politician and as a legislature, uh, a legislator, when you refer to politicians who bank in Switzerland, uh, you cast a despairing remark against me. And as a uh, witness, uh, that doesn't go over too well. The citizens and taxpayers of Chicago believe that the same people who have been victimizing us by rigging the taxes in favor of special interests against the ordinary taxpayer, the same interests for example, that kept that IC air rights area that we're talking about off the tax rolls, illegally off the tax rolls, 
for 18 months after it was turned over for commercial development. A, sh a shocking deprivation of money when the schools need money. You don't think that if, uh, if, a, if a small homeowner has, a, has an improvement that they, that they omit that from the tax rolls, but $6 million in tax money was lost annually. Those same people who run that crooked assessor's office, some of them have been uh, indicted. I think it's highly irregular to go into the taxing authorities to charge crooked and has nothing to do with the bill, it's not germane to these hearings. And I'm going to rule it out of order and we continue with the next question. Well, Senator, the question was I, raised. I, I, I realize Senator, that the that question was raised. Man, the right Representative Mann, you are not going to shout me down. The question has been answered and we've gone beyond the question. Now, do you want to hold these hearings or don't you? It's your bill. Next question. We went to Springfield and got these hearings. Please, please leave whoever's out there. I'll I be glad to leave, but before All right, I you may. You're asked to leave and you can't keep still. I'm leaving, but you're Goodbye. Going to Goodbye. Goodbye. You'll bill. escort him out, if you will, please. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, then get out. If you mouth. can't keep your mouth shut, get out. Don't spoil it for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> These other people want this bill heard. <coughs> shut your big mouth and get out. Oh, I, I really must say this. Now, you may sit down too, or you may leave off. Now, wait. Leave, Do you want me to close this up? Uh, no. Sit down. I you're don't. out of order. I don't. I now, we came here to hear it. This is completely irrelevant. You may leave. Joe, need to come out. Goodbye. Uh, most people have the notion that if any great change is to be effected, it will be done through the government or through the bureaucracy or through education, somebody else's education. Whereas the only place where any real change begins is with oneself. <laughs> The city is people. It is people that are the real riches of the city. People who suffer from the city's current harshness and hazards. And people who must change it. Our cities and city governments have become too big to manage intelligently from a central authority. They are over-centralized and, according to experts like Lewis Mumford, should be decentralized. Each area of the city should be able to exercise control over the affairs of life that directly concern it. At the heart of a healthy city is the village, the small community, the neighborhood. At the heart of the neighborhood is the individual who feels that if something is wrong, he can do something to change it. A healthy city is one in which the people, all the people, have a stake in the functioning order something to lose if that order breaks down, a sense that it is responsive to their needs.